Hi, I'm Jen Drummond. Welcome to my podcast, Take a Break. Take a Break is about enhancing and preserving the greatest asset you have, you. Today, we have Whitney Johnson with us. She is amazing at all levels, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, CEO of WLJ Advisors, and one of the 50 leading business thinkers in the world as named by Thinkers 50. She's an award-winning author, world-class keynote speaker, frequent lecturer for the Harvard Business School's Corporate Learning, and an executive coach advisor to CEOs. She has over 1.8 million followers on LinkedIn, where she was selected as a top voice in 2018. The list goes on and on, but I want to take time to talk to her. So thank you. Thank you. But yes. All right. So here's where I want to start because I'm in Utah and you graduated from BYU with a music degree. You moved to New York so your husband can pursue his PhD and you take a job as a secretary at Smith Barney. Okay, so walk us through that because so many of us graduate with this concept of here's my degree and here's what I'm going to do. And you pivoted right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, as you said, I graduated from BYU. My husband and I moved to New York. He's getting his PhD and um, someone needs to put food on the table. And that person is me. And I actually, even though I had graduated music, I didn't really want to do music. And I think that sometimes happens where we start a degree and we think, well, I just need to finish this. And that's what your parents want you to do. But then when you get out into the real world, you think, I don't really want to do this. And I would like to make money. So what am I going to do? Um, I started as a, as an assistant, as a secretary, uh, because I was, as we have established a music major, I didn't have very much confidence and, um, and I was a woman and in the late eighties, early nineties, there weren't a lot of jobs for women other than sort of still secretary school teacher kind of, um, gigs. And so I, um, got a job working at Smith Barney. And I still remember it was 1345 Avenue of the Americas. Cause you always remember the address of your first job. And I remember going to work every single day. And I was sitting across from this bullpen of young stockbrokers, pretty much all male, uh, aspiring masters of the universe. And they would say they were trying to open up brokerage accounts. And so they would say things like, uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that this is a good, good stock. And then they would say, throw down your pom-poms and get in the game. And at first, when they said that, I was, I was a little bit offended because I was a cheerleader in high school. But as I heard them say that over and over again, something just clicked in my head. And I thought, I need to throw down my pom-poms. And so I started taking business courses at night, accounting, finance, economics. And then I had a boss who believed in me, who allowed me, who made it possible for me to move from being a secretary to an investment banker. And that was really the beginning. And I I, I wouldn't have known to call it this then, but that was the beginning of me disrupting myself, of, of stepping back from the perception of who I was and who I could be to think, I could actually have a career on Wall Street. In fact, I want a career on Wall Street. So how do I figure out how to make that happen? That's amazing. I absolutely love that. I started in finance as well. And so I started out of college. I took a job with a company in the financial advisor realm, right? And what my advantage was is even then, 3% were women right? So you'd go to these conferences and there'd be a million Joes, but maybe two Jens because we're all Jennifer this decade. So, um, (laughs) but it was so advantageous to be able to get your name out and network because you were an outlier. You were not the normal. So it was easier to remember who you were. And I really felt that was an advantage to springboard my career forward in that field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I love about that, Jen, is this idea of there, when you're in an underrepresented group, there are all sorts of disadvantages, right? Um, You're judged on uh, track record rather than potential. But as you point out, you found what your distinctive strength was and your distinctive strength was one of these things doesn't look like the other ones. And so people remembered you. And so if you were able to 
to um, be memorable, that turned, you turned that into an advantage. I love that. Yeah. 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 No, it's fun. Um, okay. So not only do you go back to school, right? When you get out, your husband's taking courses, you're doing this, you're putting food on the table. And then you like, tell me the evolution within the field, because you Mm -hmm. are challenging yourself and then you, you don't allow yourself to plateau. And when we talk about your S curve and how you entered in, like, let's go through the S curve of that career, if that's okay. okay, And kind of explain that. Absolutely. Okay. So should I explain the S curve quickly? And then I'll, and then I'll, I'll describe my, my career as an S curve. So the S curve, um, some of your listeners may be familiar with it. If they're in product management, um, it's used to, um, for the product life cycle. And it was popularized about 60 years ago by Everett Rogers, a sociologist to look at how quickly, um, an innovation will be adopted or how groups change over time. And we used it at the disruptive innovation fund, um, with Clayton to figure out, for investing. So how quickly will the innovation be adopted? And therefore, should we be buying the stock now or should we be shorting the stock, et cetera? Well, as I was, as we were investing, I had this big aha or this insight that you could use the S curve to understand how do individuals change? How do we learn and how do we grow? And so if, if you can, in your mind, I want you just to trace this S and I want you to start and draw a line from, from the left to the right. And that's the launch point of an S. And then you've got, you move this up the steep, sleek back of the S and that's the sweet spot. And then you get this plateau place where is, is mastery. And so what's going on in your brain is that whenever you start something new, your brain is running these predictive models and they're making lots of predictions, many of which are inaccurate. And so your, your dopamine drops, which doesn't feel very good. And so even though you're growing, you have this experience of it feels very slow. So that's the first part of the S curve is this growth is happening, but it feels slow. That's the launch point. Then you continue to run those predictions. They become increasingly accurate. So this is the steep part of the curve. And that's the place where it's hard, but not too hard. It's easy, but not too easy. Your dopamine now is spiking. You're having all these emotional upside surprises. And so it feels exhilarating and you feel like you're exactly where you're supposed to be. And that's the sweet spot. So you've got slow, and now you have this place where growth not only is fast, it feels fast. So slow and then fast. And then you get to the top of the curve. And what's interesting about here, thinking about it as the top of the mountain, um, which is an important um, um, motif for you, is that you now have figured things out. The predictive model is correct, but because you're no longer learning, you're not getting a lot of dopamine. And so growth slows. So you've got um, slow and then fast and then slow, which is a model for us to think about what growth looks like. And you can use it whether you're applying it to your career. You can use it whether you're applying it to learning a new skill or hobby. You can apply it to a day. You can apply it to your life. So now to your question of, of tracing the arc of my career. So whenever you graduate from college, you've jumped from one S curve to another. Um, And so I was at the launch point of that S curve as, um, as an executive assistant, but then I said, Oh, I got to the top of the curve. I really want to do something. I want to go onto the professional track. So jump to the bottom of a new S curve, move along that as, um, as an investment banking analyst and move up to the top of the curve. And then, um, and then I got pushed off a curve because what happened is my boss gets fired And they probably would have fired me as well, but I was pregnant and I had good reviews. So you don't do that. So bump onto a new curve. And sometimes you get pushed. Sometimes you jump. So now I'm on an S curve of being an equity analyst, which by the way, even though I got pushed here, it was a career maker because it turns out I was really good at spotting momentum in stocks. And so I move up that S curve for eight years as an equity analyst, get to the top of that S curve. And then this time I disrupt myself. I jump to the bottom of a new curve and become an entrepreneur, connect with Clayton Christensen at the Harvard Business School, go on to that S curve of starting a fund with him where we're investing, move to the top of that S curve, and then jump to the bottom of a new S curve where I start my own business disruption advisors, where I speak. And now I've written, I've just written my fourth book. And what I get to do now is I get to 
put this S curve tool out into the world so people can see where they are in their growth and then wrap coaching and advising and, and workshops and speaking all around that. But it's all in service of growth. I have figured out this model to help you think about what growth looks like. And when you understand what it looks like, you increase your capacity to grow. And I want every single person that I come in contact with to have that metaphor, that model in your mind, because it makes it easier for you when you're doing these things that are hard to say, oh, it's normal. I'm at the launch point or, oh, I'm really good at this, but I feel like I can no longer keep doing it. Then, you know, you're in mastery and it's time for you to jump to a new curve. Right, 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 right. No, the, the S curve is such an amazing visual to mm-hmm. be able to use. And then it takes away the emotion of our decision making, right? All of a sudden I have this, this concept or this philosophy to anchor me down and it allows me to be very methodical about, oh, I have this emotion, but that does not mean I need to act on it. It's normalized in this segment of where I am. And I was actually, I have a son who's in high school right now or out for the summer and we were going through things and I'm like, okay, so where do you think you are on this curve that we just talked about? Okay. And how does that feel? And, you know, he's going to this golf camp and he's brand new at golf and he's so used to being good at something. And so he's frustrated. And I said, oh, but look where we are on the S curve. And it was just so fun to have that visual. So we had language around what we were doing, right? Yeah. 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 Isn't it, isn't it wonderful when you have this simple visual model and, and so it makes it so useful to be able to talk ourselves through, but like you said, to talk our children through and and through this process. And, and like you said, normalizing it for him. Right, 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 right. And here's another thing that I've noticed. So I'm into mountaineering as you've read a little bit, and I'm heading to K2 for the second time this summer, because last summer we did not summit. And I was not feeling excited about it. I just, I kind of like, oh, you've almost been there, done that. So, but I haven't done it all the way. So you have to go back. But one of the things I did is I reached out to try to bring some other women to the mountain. So I have one of the first Pakistani climbers climbing with us. It's a female. And then also a female from Nepal to hopefully summit with us or at least be on the journey as far as they're capable of going. And I think sometimes when we get to that mastery area, maybe perhaps, but just still have to go through, there's ways that we can lean in and figure out how do we make this exciting again? Mm. How do we make it so that we want to go and can pull that energy? And sometimes that is bringing somebody else along, right? Mm. Oh, Um, So I just was, that was when I was looking at the S curve and I was thinking about my own self of like, oh, I did, this is how I'm excited again. I'm bringing somebody up the S curve. And I think that's one of the joys of mastery to someone. Yeah. Oh, I love that, Jen. So a couple of thoughts come to mind as you share that. Number one is this idea of when you are in mastery, if you're willing to do S curve loops, which is what you just described of bringing a Pakistani woman of being bringing a Nepali woman along, you're effectively doing this S curve loop of saying, yes, I'm in mastery, but I'm going to help you climb that mountain. And I'm going to bring you along. And that's a whole different skill set of bringing other people along. So, and then I want to share one other metaphor with you that I, I wonder if it will resonate. So if you think about um, mountaineering, like you said, when you're, when you're at the launch point um, of a mountain, you have plenty of oxygen, but you don't necessarily yet have the capacity to climb the mountain when you get into the sweet spot. So you're halfway up the mountain, you still have enough oxygen, but your capacity is absolutely increasing. When you get to the top of the mountain, you've got the capacity to climb the mountain because you just did it, but there's not enough oxygen because you've hit the death zone. Right. So you have to move to a new mountain. Does that metaphor resonate? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Well, the whole, the whole mountain chapter in smart growth, right? That I'm like, Oh, this is my language. I understand this. This is perfect. And that's what I loved about. That's why I really, like, I love smart growth, but Mm -hmm. I really think you have to read disrupt yourself as well, Mm -hmm. because disrupt yourself allows you to really apply it to you. And we're going to talk about some stories that I hope you can coach me through. And then the smart growth allows you to say, oh, this is how it works in an environment, or this is how I foster mm. this within my people. And it, it was, it's just a great compliment to each other. Like I really mm. liked those two together. So that's mm. been fun for me to read. 
Um, but when of the, one of the big things you say, um, is you're in this explorer phase, right? And you need to choose, um, how do you keep the emotions out of those decisions when you're in that explorer phase and everything's mm -hmm. new and you're not always feeling the most confident? Yeah, I, I, I think, I don't know that we can keep our emotions out of it, but okay. I think if we can understand the experience that we're having, then we will be able to manage through it. So if we understand that we're doing something new, um, we're thrilled that we're doing something new, or we may have been pushed to do something new, but we understand that we're doing something new. We also know that the older we get, the more we can insulate ourselves from ever doing anything new. So we get out of practice. And one of the gifts of the pandemic was it forced us to practice doing new things. But if you understand that your brain is making these predictions, as we discussed, and the predictions are inaccurate and dopamine is going to drop and dopamine is a chemical messenger of delight. So you're de delighted. That doesn't feel good. If you understand that you're mapping new territory, which means that it is cognitively um, taxing, it's emotionally taxing that starts to normalize it. If you understand that your identity is shifting, you're no longer who you were and not, but you're not yet who you're going to be. That allows you to say, I'm terrified. I'm overwhelmed. I'm discouraged. I'm impatient. How come I haven't figured it out yet? It allows you to understand that all those feelings are completely normal and, and disentangle the, the language that sometimes goes through our head of, I feel overwhelmed. I must be bad at this. We right. jump to that inclusion conclusion. And instead we say, I may be bad at this, but right now I don't have enough information to know. What I do know is that right now I'm doing this new thing and I feel gangly and awkward. So I need to do it a little bit longer. So I figure out if I actually want to continue to do it, or in fact, I don't. Right, 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 right. And then when on the personal level, right, this is where, when we're taking the right risks, Mm -hmm. And to you, so I, this is something I've recently done where I was building the financial career and from the outside, everybody's like, oh, this is amazing, blah, 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 blah. And then I said, well, I'm going to flip and get into mountaineering, right? <laughs> you, I mean, jaws Super drop. logical. logical <laughs> right, right, right. right. They're like, um, you know that, like take the right risks. We're a little <laughs> worried right now about you. And you've done this multiple times in your career where you've been at the top of these different things mm -hmm. and then started over at the bottom. Walk me through how you've navigated that with peers and friends and family that might at first feel like they're not supporting you just because it's such mm -hmm. a shock to their system. Mm. Yeah. So I, you raise a really good point because when you're, when you're at the top of a curve and you want to do something new, you want to disrupt yourself. You're not only disrupting yourself, but you're asking the people around you to be disrupted. And that can be really uncomfortable for them as well. And so one of the things that I really um, encourage people to do is to recognize, okay, if I want to disrupt myself, it's probably because it's not that they're the functional job isn't being done. You were making money. You had a career, you had status within your, within your sphere of influence, but there was a, there was an emotional job that wasn't being done. There is that feeling. And that's how, you know, typically when you're at the top of a curve, which is that feeling of, I know there's more for me. I can feel it. I know there is. And if I don't do that, I will die inside a little. And so if you understand, okay, functional job being done, but emotional job isn't being done. And then you can have that conversation with people and saying, I want to disrupt myself, but I'm also inviting you to disrupt yourself in the process. How can I pack a parachute for you? What does that need to look like? So it feels safe for you as well. What guardrails do we need to put in place so that my disruption allows you to disrupt in a way that you're happy with and not, not unhappy and not so disrupted, so overwhelmed that you shut down. And so that's how I think about it is this recognition that we work with and live within an ecosystem. And if there are things that we want to do, because we feel that we must, how can we bring other people along with us? I love that. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the books you talk about really trying to spend, I think it was maybe 60% of your time and your sweet spot mm -hmm. so that you just, 
when you know that, then you, it kind of helps you just, okay, here's how my day runs. I'm not doing this up and down and up and down. I have this spot that I'm going to be in, but I still have to do these two other things. Right. That's right. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, so what, um, what you're referring to is, is thinking about how do you optimize for growth? And so if you think about a standard bell curve, you want to have about 60% of your day, 60% of, of your career where you're in this, the sweet spot, I mean, pro, meaning projects in the sweet spot, but then 20% where you're doing these new things, um, so that you continue to innovate and then 20% where you really are in mastery so that it can serve as an anchor for everything else that you're doing. Right. Right, right, right. Okay. So then like phase two of this whole S curve is really doing like you're collecting, you're collecting data. You have this childlike Mm -hmm. curiosity. And in that space, we're, we're looking at our belief systems. We're Mm -hmm. looking for feedback. We're really just again, curating knowledge that we need to move forward in companies where we're collecting our feedback how, how does a culture really develop that where it feels safe to have those weaknesses mm. and not have them exposed? And all of a sudden, oh, how do I get ahead? Because now, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, like, I sometimes absolutely. Feel like when someone knows my weakness, that's not always great, but really in this case, it's helping you get to the next piece. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, so if I hear you correctly, it's the question of when I expose that I'm actually new at something, what does that mean? So, and, and how does it get interpreted and how we make it safe for that? Um, number one is by having this S curve language, I think that does help a bit, help mitigate that because you can say to everybody, Hey, we've got this S curve. We do launch point, sweet spot mastery right now. I'm in the launch point. So news flash, as if you didn't already know, I'm going to be kind of awkward. So be aware, but let's see what we can learn in the process. Let's see what we're, what, and I I want to have you tell me, what are you seeing so that I can learn so that I can get better faster. I think one of the biggest gifts that we can give to people is to give them feedback about what is working and what isn't, um, because that's us saying I'm invested in you because it's uncomfortable to give feedback. So if we're willing to give feedback, we're actually saying I'm invested in you getting better. Um, I think perhaps one of the most important things that we can do though, is, Um, well, actually two things when something is not working is to say, Hey, that didn't work systemically. What isn't working? What was wrong with the system that it didn't work because so often, and I'm sure that you see this in mountaineering. It's not that a person meant to mess up. It's just, Oh, we didn't have a checklist to remind us that we needed to bring X, Y, or Z tool along. Let's go back and adapt the system. And now to the most important thing. When you as a a manager, whoever has the most power within that group, it is absolutely vital that when someone gives you feedback, you don't retaliate in any way. You say, thank you. I appreciate that. You act on it. You call people back out saying, thank you for that. I made this shift because of that. And When you see the people on your team respond to the feedback that you've given them in a really positive, like, oh, yep, made a mistake. I'll correct it. I'll move on. Call it out. Hey, I noticed how you took that feedback with absolutely no drama and and improved. And so those are just different micro things that you can do to make it safe for people. But it really starts with you as the person who has the most power in in that room to be willing to accept it to welcome it, to act on it, to not retaliate when you do receive it. Mm -hmm. Right. I like that. And I like on the personal level, this is the area where we define our strengths Mm -hmm. and define our weaknesses and we all have strengths. And so learning to play to our strengths is so important in accomplishing any goal. I know when I'm on the mountain, I'm a little bit shorter than some of my teammates. Right. And so and I'm not as heavy or as tall as a big of a structure. So I cannot carry as much weight, but that doesn't mean I can't aid in helping with the cooking or the cleaning up of the table or making snow forts that protect all of our tents. Right. So I do think a lot of times when we get feedback and we think about our strengths and our weaknesses, there's ways to use those to our advantage as a team Mm -hmm. and really encouraging that and saying, Hey, but here's where I can help out, or here's where you did help us that just has always been really beneficial for us. Oh, yeah. That's so good, Jen. And, 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 and 
I think one of the challenges with our strengths, at least what I've observed is that because um, your strength is something that you do so reflexively well, sometimes you don't value it. So you're climbing up the mountain. You think, I wish I were the big, strong, you know, six foot five person that's, you know, hefting this thing. And you're like, well, but I'm not. And so you value that, but you don't value the thing is that maybe you're a really great chef. And so people feel nourished and f- people feel this sense of community and, and communion and, and oxytocin because of what you're cooking. And I'm just making things up, but you don't value it because, well, of course you can cook really well. Cause you've already, you know, you've done it your whole life. And so I think that's one of the, the real challenges for us of moving up any S curve is once we recognize what we do well, and we know it because people give us compliments on it is to really own it and value it because that's when you're going to be able to make an outsized idiosyncratic contribution. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. And on the mountains, we acclimatize, right? And this is kind of what this S curve is saying too. You go up to this point, then you come back down and then that allows your body to adjust a little bit. And then you go back up to that point and it's easier because mm-hmm. you've taken this back step that's actually been able to spring you forward. And I, I love the mountain metaphors just because it relates on so many levels. But I, one of the reasons why we named this podcast, Take a Break, is because it's so easy to get in the flow of going, 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 going. But really, it's in that break that we have the mm-hmm. opportunity to absorb what we just were doing, look at it, reflect on it and say, okay, these pieces are working, these pieces are not, let's keep, now we can go forward with less weight to carry up the mountain, mm. right? Oh, I love, I love that you've named it that, this idea of step back to slingshot forward of, and, and I'll share with you this one quote that I think is so powerful and, and really um, dovetails beautifully what, with what you're describing is, is Tiffany Schlein. She wrote a book called 24 six, and she makes the statement, what if we thought of rest as technology? Because the promise of technology is that makes your life better. It makes it easier. And we know from the research and obviously, as you just described, rest actually makes us more productive, allows us to move up the mountain. So I love that idea of rest is a technology. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's good. Okay. So you have this, I I read somewhere in one of the books, a one second app, Uh huh. right? Mm -hmm. And this one second app lets you do like a snapshot of the day or whatever what, like what, tell the audience, like how you found that, why you found it, what it does for you. And these little, cause I think these little recharge moments that we all can have benefit all of us. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So it's called one second every day. And I found it via Dan Pink. Okay. Um, so who I love, and this is probably about four years ago. And what it does, um, technically what it does is that you take a picture every day Um, and then you load it into your app. And so you can look at your, I've got mom on my phone. I can look at the past four years and I can see a photo for every day. Now, to be clear, I don't end up doing the photo every day. It might be that I have three photos today and they, they end up populating it, but I do have four years of 365 days of a photo. Now, the reason that I love this is number one is it allows me to capture my life visually, but it also serves a purpose when you're thinking about moving up an S curve about this idea of collecting data, because we know that our brain filter, it has this, this magnificent filtering mechanism. And we also know that whatever we focus on, we get more of, and there, you know, we talk about visualization boards or action boards. And so the other thing that this one second, every day app serves serves is it allows me to say, What pictures do I want to put up on here? What do I want to remember? Because every day that I put up a picture that I want to remember, I'm reminding myself of the life that I want to live, the life that I want to have. And so it effectively becomes this, not only this memory board, but it also becomes this action board of, yes, I want to spend time with my family. Yes, I want to, you know, go to church on Sunday. Yes, I want to be on stage speaking. Yes, I want to um, play the piano. And it just allows me to have this action board to prime my brain to jump to the curves that I want to jump to. Mm -hmm. I like it. I love it. I, I was reading about it and I was looking it up and there's now probably five or six of those apps in the system. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to play with these a little bit and see what one works. Mm-hmm. 
So here's one for yeah. you. Oh, wait, wait, before yeah. you go on. So yeah, what, yeah, yeah. what I would love for you to do is when you go on, um, when you do K2 is yes. to do a photo every single day up the mountain. Great oh, idea. Yes. Super, Perfect. Super <laughs> awesome. So that every single person on that mountain has a photo every single day. I think it'll be really, really compelling. Oh, that'd be so fun to see. And see what different people take photos of. Yes. Right. I'm always so yes. curious. That's probably the best thing about mountain climbing is you're away from the world. You're in nature. You're with people that all have the same pursuit from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I'll be a minority as an American there and there's nothing to interrupt us. So the conversations and the storytelling and the sharing, and it's, it's the best part of the whole deal. But uh -huh. we, I swear we climb the mountain for the, not the mountaintop, right? It's, I mean, we enjoy the mountaintop because it's reflective of all the things we've overcame and said yes, when we could have said no and all those little significant events. But it's about like the people that you're with and mm -hmm. the impact that you have on each other. And you just learn at a different level, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm a, a three-year-old over there for oh, about a month. It's so it's much so, fun. <laughs> it's so beautiful. And it, oh, I love that idea of every single person taking pictures and then putting them together. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Oh, I like it. Mm. Okay. So leveraging failure is mm. a big piece of this, right? Because failure is in all of our lives. I was on Mount Logan in May and mm. we did not summit. And it was not anything that had to do with me physically, right? The weather didn't cooperate. There's, you know, some other things outside of our control mm -hmm. on a logical standpoint. Okay. I get it. Right. Mm -hmm. On an emotional standpoint, I still kind of, I mean, to me, I want to shove someone in the kibosh. Like I want like, you have all this, like you, oh. it's sad. It's hard. It's frustrating. What do you have any tips on how to navigate through that faster? Yeah. Or do you just like, you know? Yeah, I do actually. Okay. Um, wonderful. I, okay. So my first tip is, is to allow yourself to grieve. Yeah. And, um, I, I don't remember who said this, but we don't want to, um, we don't want to stop feeling. We want to get, we don't want to feel better. We want to get better at feeling because when you allow yourself to just say, this didn't work and I'm really sad, then you're honoring that emotion. You're honoring, you know, I feel sad about this and allow yourself to be in that place. You don't need to be there for a long time, but allow yourself to be sad because what it's also doing is it's honoring you it's honoring the emotion and it's honoring the fact that this mattered to you. And so I think when things don't work, that's an important, an important part of the process is to allow ourselves to grieve. The second part of this that I think is really important, and it's something that I am very much in the process of learning is to recognize that failure, something working, isn't a referendum on you. And so often I, what I've realized is that, um, we, we think that failure is the issue, but it's actually not the failure. It's oftentimes the shame that we attach to the failure. It's that feeling of, oh, there's something inherently wrong or bad about me. I'm not worthy. And to, to quote Brene Brown, um, when in fact is you didn't, there's no shame. It's just that you did something and it didn't work. And so you ran this experiment. And so you're, you're, you're learning something. And, um, and so that has been very, very helpful for me is to just say, Am I running experiments as opposed to, you know, did it work or did it not? And then the other thing that I have found and I'm finding very helpful is I just lost my train of thought. Here's what I want to say. I have found with a lot of athletes and I would put you in the, in the category of athlete is that sometimes they feel shame around things that are actually to the rest of the world, impressive feats. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I was talking to a colleague and he's telling me about his career. And I, at a later date, found out that he was a top 10 tennis player in high school when he was in college or in high school, top 10 tennis player in the United States when he was in high school. And I said to him, well, why didn't you tell me about that? I'm like, why do you, like, that's impressive. And he said, because I was ashamed. I'm like, what you were, what are you talking about? And he said, well, because I didn't get as good as I thought I was going to be. I didn't go 
pro. And my comment to him was, it's the shame. It is always the shame. So here's what I would say. When there's failures around things that you care about, there might be shame. And if there is, that is an absolute gold mine, because if you can look at it and uncover it and do a reframe around it, it's going to be one of your best stories. It's going to be one of your formative stories, one of your crucible stories, one of your origin stories. And so my advice is, is that failure is not a referendum on you allow yourself to grieve and recognize that this can become a gold mine. If you can reframe it and teach other people and become really, um, to incubate who you are and, and the, the wherewithal that you have to do everything that you're going to do for the rest of your life. Yeah. That there is power in that for sure. It's just, it's just been interesting. I'm one of those people that prior to this whole mountaineering adventure of trying to be the first female to climb the seven second summits, I would, I'm going to do it. Then I'll share right? So it's just so much more comfortable to be, oh, I'm going to do it. And then I can share it. Now, when you're doing it out in the open and people are following and it's just, it's heavy, right? Because they feel bad for you and you, and you feel bad. You're like, no, I don't want you to feel bad. I want you to understand, like, maybe I had this failure so that you all understand that it's not straight up. Like we have these pauses, yeah. we have these things and how much time we spend in failure, like thinking about it. Versus when you have a success, I'm almost on to the next thing. And I never really give myself a chance to even celebrate it as much as I think maybe we mm -hmm. should. Mm -hmm. um, so when I came home, we had failure cake because we always have success <laughs> cake, right? I'm like, we're having failure cake still because we're celebrating the process, not the result, right? And the kids are, we have cake. We'll have cake for any reason, mom. Perfect, right? No one's, oh, no one's arguing at my house, but I do think it's just been an interesting experience of learning how to sit with that, dissect it and go from that victim to empowerment and mm -hmm. what that process looks like for all of us mm -hmm. is just so different. Mm -hmm. Have you gotten better at it over time? I have, well, I have, because what happens is you have children and then <laughs> you realize when they start doing things, you're like, Oh, that came. Yeah. I need to redo this so that they have another example of how to navigate through this piece. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. that's kind of been the fun thing about mountaineering is because it's so visual. Mm -hmm. And so we have so many lessons that we're learning in parallel. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to rock climb before I went to Mount Kenya. So I had to learn how to rock climb and be a beginner at it again. And they're being beginners at something else. So we can kind of complain about being a beginner together. Right. Yeah. And yeah. it's, it's been a fun adventure and, you know, there's ups and downs and everything that we do, but yeah, it's been interesting. Oh, I love that. I remember my therapist saying to me years ago when I was, you know, fretting about my children, um, cause I think everybody frets about their children. And she said to me, you just need to remember that they pay attention to about 10% of what you say, but 90% of what they are going to get from you is what you're modeling for them. And right. so when you said this idea of you've learned how to rock climb, I'm like, I just had this visual of your children looking at you and being like, you go mom. And at the same time, they're internalizing it. If, if my mom can do hard things, I can do hard things. And that just, that just makes my, my whole brain smile with happiness for your children. Oh, I, yes. So I climbed Everest last year, which is not a second summit. And I went to the school and we had this whole little campaign of what's your Everest goal. So then the kids set there, cause I was never, I'd never been away from home that long. Yeah. So I went to the school and said, Hey, listen, I'm going to be gone for a while. Can you keep an extra eye on my kids just because I won't be there and I want you aware. Well, then the school got involved and said, Oh, well, if you're going to Everest, let's do this together oh. as a school. Oh. And so then we put little hikers in the hallways and the kids got to say what their goal was. And we talked about goal setting. And then I, you know, nowadays you can do a FaceTime call from Everest base camp. So I'm doing Zoom calls with all the little classrooms. And, you know, the kids are like, how do you eat? Where do you go to the bathroom? You know, kids questions, right? Right. Right. And then I come <laughs> and we summited, thank goodness. And so we came home and then I talked to them about like, what goals did they summit while I was gone? And watching all of like, Everest is so magical to people, mm -hmm. right? And so then watching all of them be like, 
you climbed Everest. And my daughter was on a ski lift and I'm riding behind her and I can kind of hear, she's like, my mom climbed Everest. And she said, I can too. Right. And I think what we sometimes forget is that we're all so interconnected to each other. Right. And that's the ecosystem that you talk about. And when I do me and elevate myself, I give you permission to do the same. And just by showing up, the energy shifts, everything changes. And I really think we get, need to give ourselves more credit for oh, those pieces. I love that. What your daughter said, my mom climbed Everest and I can too. That's the best. Like that makes it completely worth everything. Right. <laughs> right. Right. I can pee in a hole for a whole month. No problem. <laughs> right. It's all those things. Ramen noodles for day 27. Sure. <laughs> so. Oh. but yeah, 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 yeah. Um, what, like, what has been your, so one of the challenges that I read about for you is that you have had choices, right? Where you're deciding what path do I take? They're mm-hmm. both amazing. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I think it was between starting this company and then also doing a fund that would help women entrepreneurs, right? Which are huge causes that Mm -hmm. both ring to both of our hearts. I love the path you chose because look how much you've created for the world. So thank you. But how at at that moment, at that time, like how did you decipher between the two and decide to go the route that you did? Mm. That's a great question. I think that... So there are lots of questions that we can ask ourselves when we're trying to decide if we want to, to climb a curve. Um, you know, do I believe that I can believe that I can do it? Does it, is it hard, but not too hard? Does it fit with my values? Is it in align with my purpose, et cetera? Um, in this particular instance, as you said, I, I was going down this path of starting this venture fund with Kay, um, Kay Koplovitz and Amy Wildstein to invest in women. And they've done some really good things. They've invented, invested in Hint Water and the Real Real. And it was very exciting or I could go down the path that I'm on now. And I think that what it came down to is while I wanted to do that, um, I felt more a sense of calling and a sense, a greater sense of calling and a greater sense of purpose around the work that I am doing now. And so I think Jen, the, the only real answer that I have for you is that you, it comes down to your sense of purpose and, um, what, you know, can you gain momentum in both, which the answer is yes. But what the, the, the final ultimate first prior question is, does this feel like this is what I'm on the planet to do? Does this feel like this is the way that I'm going to be able to bless the most lives? And for me, it was this path. It was still difficult to do. You can't, every ship can't sail. You can't climb every mountain. But this was the decision um, that I felt in my heart, in my sort of, from a providential perspective, this was the decision for me. And so it's, it's, what do you feel inside? What's your purpose? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then when you headed down that path, Mm -hmm. you brought on another individual rather early, right? If I'm in. Not that early, oh, okay. um, not that early. So this was, so when I made this decision, it was 2012. Um, okay. I actually started working with Amy Humble, who's now the co-founder of disruption advisors in 2015, but was initially on very small projects. Okay. And I think that's the thing, um, from, you know, this idea of mountaineering together, summiting a mountain together. I do think, as you said, I love that idea of it's you, it's so wonderful to do it with other people and to feel connected with them. But when you're doing something really big, like climbing a mountain, like starting a business, like having a family, whatever those are, it's really important to be patient and take your time at the launch point, Mm -hmm. not get hasty, not get impatient to get started. Take your time to, to figure out, you know, how do you work together? What happens when things don't work? How do you treat each other? Do you treat each other with dignity? Um, And so I started working with her in 2000. 15, 2016, but we only ended up becoming business partners 
in 2021. So we had five years where we were working together, gradually increasing how we were working together, but, but it took that many years to figure out what that was going to look like. And so I really, um, I think that's an important thing is to be willing at the launch point of a curve, especially with relationships to be patient and not jump into them too quickly. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Because it gave you a chance to date, right. And figure out here's what you're good at. Here's what I'm good at. And how do we synergetically work together? And I love that because a lot of times I feel we have this unspoken pressure of, Hey, we need to, we need to be here. We need to be here. We need to be here. And you had enough confidence to allow it to organically unfold as it needed to. Right. And there's two things. Number one is we get impatient because we don't like uncertainty. And so we want to make a decision. But the other thing is back to the failure question that you asked me earlier. Um, a few, you know, I talked about this in the book as well as where we had invested in a magazine and it was an absolute abysmal failure, hundreds of thousands of dollars lost partnership completely dissolved, but it was those lessons learned there. Those lessons were crucial in thinking about how to form this partnership. So painful. Yes. But I'm grateful that it happened now. Right. Like I think you figured out, Hey, it was part of the journey to get there. And I think, so when I started in the financial service field, this is going to date me, we could still cold call. Uh Okay. So I graduated from college and I took this job. I didn't even know that cold calling was a part of it. I didn't even know to ask about cold calling. I will tell you that from that experience, I will be a better at interviewing for the rest of my life. Right. You're like, so when I took the job, I was not, my, my parents said, you are not allowed to quit. You have to work there for at least a year. If you're, cause I graduated from college a year early. So I was young and they were giving me parental advice and I took that as gospel. So mm-hmm. I just remember hearing cold calling, cold calling, calling, and hearing no, 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 no. And it was destroying me. So I had to reframe the game to be able to make it work. And I finally learned that if I made 98, if I got 98 no's, I would eventually get a yes. And it'd be maybe $3,000. So I knew every 98 equal equal $3,000 or whatever the number was, right? And so then every day you're just like, okay, I just need to get through my 98 no's because then I'm going to make my $3,000 based on my stats that I've been keeping to keep everything going. And um, I think those failures at first feel so big, but then when you realize they're part of the bigger picture of so much Mm -hmm. more that's possible, you welcome them at some level, right? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I listen to that, two things stick out to me. Number one, I, even though probably you were just very angry with your parents at the time, what a gift they handed to you on a silver platter of you cannot quit a cold calling job. Like that is amazing. And then the second thing I hear from that is this idea of you are okay with people saying no to you because you've become inured to it. And that is a huge, huge massive superpower that you probably have. I love right. it. Yeah. Well, you don't even realize you have it, right? You're like, Oh no. Okay. Well let's try again. And now you watch your kids do it. Right. You're like, no means no. And they're going to try every angle they can to get around that. No, it's so funny. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm kind of the same. So <laughs> whatever. Um, so where are you on your S curve now? Mm. So I would say with my career, I'm in the sweet spot. Um, something that we didn't talk about is that your career is a portfolio of S curves. And so, um, I would say from a, as a podcaster, I'm in the sweet spot, um, as a speaker, I'm in this sweet spot, kind of maybe mastery phase, um, in a, as a writer, pretty much in the sweet spot and scaling or, or sorry, our, our technology tool, absolutely at the launch point absolutely launch point. We're about to launch a certification launch point, um, scaling a business launch point. But when you put all of these together, when you, when, you know, as an amalgam or you aggregate them overall, it's in the sweet spot. So I feel like I'm continually learning and I feel thrilled and excited to do the work that I'm doing. So 
Yeah. Sweet spot. So good. I mm-hmm. love it. Yeah. And when you look at your website and you can see the tools that you have to just like incubate a whole community or a business into these different things and helping them go, I, I, I love every bit of it. It makes me so mm-hmm. excited because just doing the work myself, it's hard not to want to share, right? It's mm-hmm. hard now to be like, Hey, look where I am or what I, blah, 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 blah. And so I'm not even working for you, but I feel that energy from you. And I feel even from all the material that you have out there, it's fantastic. Mm. It's Mm, so fun. Thank you. you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, Okay. So here's a question from my sister. Okay. She's working in um, and she's remote now. And Mm -hmm. she has a, a lot of people that report to her. And how do you help people do this culture when they're not in front of each other as often. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So she said, that's, that's the one thing that she, she loves being, you know, there's pros and cons to it, but it's been harder to keep the relationships or all the, the mm-hmm. ecosystem going mm-hmm. with the mm-hmm. distance. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think, um, well, first of all, I'm going to tell you, use the ask curve as a language to talk about where people are in their growth, because that allows you to start a conversation. Talk to me about where you are launch point sweet spot mastery. So that can be a backdrop from there. I will tell you a story that I think will help, um, inspire your sister. So I was having a conversation, um, and I wrote about it in my newsletter this week with a coaching client who was saying, I'm thinking about quitting my job. I said, well, why? She said, well, I, I like the company. I actually like my manager. I even like the people that I'm working with, but um, it's remote and I'm not getting enough information from people. Now, the backdrop is that she had come from another job where um, it was very toxic. They told her what a bad job she was doing all the time, even though she had worked there for five years. Yes, she should have quit sooner. She didn't. Worked there for five years. Um, and you know, so she has PTSD of like, I'm not doing a good job. So now in this environment, even where she likes everybody in the absence of that information of it's working, she's making up stories because that's the tape that's running in her head that she's doing a bad job. So, so the advice I would give to your sister, is she really your sister? Are you making it up? Yeah, no, no, she really is my sister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, when I told her I was interviewing you, she's like, can I, can I co-interview? <laughs> like, okay, no. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah. So the advice that I would, I would I give, would give is, is to, to think about how can she communicate consistently and meaning over communicate where she thinks, oh, I'm communicating enough, like over communicate. Um, what, you know, on the Slack channel, make sure when birthdays come, you're sending something check in with people at least once a week, because when you check in with people, engagement goes up and they don't need to be big check-ins. It can just be a quick check of in. Hey, I'm thinking of you. And you know, what are you, anything on your mind at the beginning of meetings, do check-ins with people, et cetera. So, so is to have a regular cadence of checking in ideally at least once a week and be consistent about it. So if you can't do it once a week, then do it every other week, but be very, very consistent And not only check in with people about, are they on task for their deliverables, but find out how they're doing in their personal life, because then they're going to feel seen. And if people feel seen, they're going to feel engaged. And perhaps if we go back to the story that I just told, they won't worry that they're not doing a good job because in the, again, absence of information, we make up stories. So communicate, communicate and communicate some more. Right. Yeah. we make up stories that are always to our detriment, right? Almost always, almost always. We don't say, Oh, I haven't heard from my manager. They must think I'm doing a terrific job. We don't do that. Most people don't. Most people don't. Some people do. And I want to be that person, but I am not that person. And most of us aren't. Yeah. 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 No, I have to remind myself. I'm like, why am I even writing this story right now? Let's stop. Uh (laughs) Right. Uh That's the whole take a break right? This i the biggest thing for me with this take a break concept is why I'm like exploring it so much is I have to take a break for myself when I'm in the positive and when I'm in the negative, because Mm. this automated flow of whatever I'm doing, right. I have to like, am I happy? Am I making, am I going towards where I go? Or am I beating myself up again? Right. And it's fascinating. I did an experiment where every hour I put a timer on for a minute. And then when that minute went off, or the timer went off, I gave myself a minute to say, okay, what was I thinking? Was it helpful? 
And then I would ground myself and be, and then just that one minute, the next rest of that hour, you kind of just even recharged and could go back at it again and just were more conscious of how you're going. Right. Oh, you love that experiment. How long did you do it for? Like two days, but it only took two days because then all of a sudden you're kind of, oh, my timer didn't go off. What am I doing? Oh, I'm good. Right. And I sometimes will make myself do it every once in a while when I'm just overwhelmed, right. I have a bigger day. I'm like, oh, I have to remind myself to take breaks because I have a tendency to not. And then at four o'clock in the afternoon, I'm a bear. Mm, (laughs) Oh, I know. I have to warn my team when it's four o'clock and we have a meeting. I say, just remember, this is my, my time of the day where my energy level is low. So I'm going to, going to be deliberate, but please give me some grace. Yeah. 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 (laughs) No, I know. I'm the same way. Okay. So your family, I have to ask the jam question, blackberry, strawberry, or raspberry. What's the favorite? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I would say probably mm, raspberry. Oh, that's us. We do raspberry jam every summer as a family. Mm, And I mm. read that you guys were into it as well. So I thought that was fun. Yeah. Oh, we love jam. No, perfect. Well, I want the audience to be able to connect with you because I am a super big fan. So tell us what's the best way to get involved in your newsletter, read your books, all your podcasts, all the fun things. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Um, So from a newsletter perspective, you can just go to whitneyjohnson.com forward slash newsletter. It's, it's a very personal newsletter where I'm basically living my life in disruption. And so, um, so that's, you can get a a taste of that. The podcast is um, disrupt yourself podcast. So that's easy to find. Um, And then if for whatever reason you want to email me, it's uh, wj at whitneyjohnson.com. So those are the best ways. Perfect. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing your time today. This is so educational and I look forward to seeing all that's going to come out of what you're doing. Thank you, John. It's been really fun.